Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, I know. I do, because I thought about this. Okay, cool. I, I don't remember anything. So, why don't we just start? <laughs> we're just in... I'm Dave. Uh, oh, hello, Dave. Um, excuse the mess behind me. Um, yes, welcome to Series 6. I don't know if we're going to put this at the start of the series, but this is the first one we're actually recording together after a break full of, I managed to damage myself, you managed to get COVID again. Again, yes. Exactly. Exactly. So it's 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 been a troubling time, but we have been gladdened by the support of our lovely patrons, and we've been gladdened by all the comments and all the nice rah that we've both got on Twitter. And we have. It's been it's been very nice. So thank you very much. Um, I have no idea. As in, Dave says he's told me what we're going to talk about this week. No, I haven't. <laughs> no, oh, okay. I told you I had not. No, I told you that I had an idea about what we're going to talk about, but I haven't told you what it is yet. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, Dave, my wonderful uh, Spanish Angly, sparkly paleontologist chum. Uh, what part of dinosaurs are we going to be discussing aujourd'hui? Um, actually, I was going to do another pterosaur. Oh, um, really? So we're not doing dinosaurs? Not today. We're doing we're other doing lizards, flappy day. lizards. Yes, yes. That are not lizards, of course, again. Oh. Um, yes, uh, Ramphorhynchus, which is one of those animals that I think everyone comes across and yet it never gets very much attention because it's just not that big and everyone likes Tyrannodon or Quetzalcoatlus. And actually, Ramphorhynchus is extremely interesting and extremely important. And much as T-Rex has become the kind of model dinosaur, like we know more about T-Rex than any other dinosaur, I would say that we know far more about Ramphorhynchus than any other pterosaur, and yet no one ever wants to talk about it. Okay. And I've got a podcast and an hour to fill. This, so. is, this is true. This is <laughs> if, true. if only there was some solution to this problem that I... I could enact <laughs> okay so let's talk about now i know what pterodon is and i know what quetzalcoatlus is quetzalcoatlus is the best one because it's the massive walking in it's america really one with the yep. with the huge head but doesn't have a throat big enough to swallow um anybody really bigger than an infant back, back, back of the back of the back of the mouth isn't actually very wide exactly no. so it really you can protect your infants by just putting a sombrero on them and then it just gets ch- stuck in its neck yes. um <laughs> And I know Pterodon, obviously. So what? Pteranodon. Pteranodon. Yeah, Pteranodon's fine. Pteranodon. So what? What? What is Ramphorhynchus? Which one is that? That's not one of the really tiny little ones, is it? No. So well. So again, that there aren't any really tiny little pterosaurs. That that's a, a misnomer because although pterosaurs could fly when they were very small, so they were very small flying pterosaurs. But these are all juveniles. Every time you see someone go, oh, there were twenty centimeter wingspan pterosaurs or pterosaurs the size of a sparrow. These were were juveniles the smallest pterosaur that we know of at adult was about a meter wingspan which is by modern bird standards big seagull um yeah crow that that kind of size so they were good sized animals and that the, there are but there are not lots of tiny pterosaur species knocking around um so Ramphorhynchus so we when we did our pterosaur episode last series or the one even the one, one before, before I think. um we talked about like the two big groups the pterodactyloids the derived ones which tend to be bigger big head long neck short tail and the Ramphorhynchoids or inverted commas Ramphorhynchoids the correct term would be non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs or even now actually probably non-monophenostratin pterosaurs but let's not worry about that um <laughs> And they are, on average, much smaller than the pterodactyloids, um, with a relatively short head and a relatively short neck, and then in particular the long tail um, and a couple of other features as well. But it's 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 the smaller ones with the long tails with the little fin on the end. Mm. And Ramphorhynchus is by far and away the best known of these. Now I think I'm going off stuff that I think that either made it into the last Terrasaur episode or mm. I've just read about in a book somewhere. <laughs> but am I right in thinking that Ram? Ramphorhynchus is an earlier pterosaur, is that right? And the later ones with the shorter tails and longer necks, or have I got that completely wrong? Well, so the, the Ramphorhynchoids definitely came first, but you had a fair period of intersection, and, and Ramphorhynchus is from that point. So the classic Songhofen lagoons of what is modern Bavaria, southern Germany, where we get Archaeopteryx, 
Um, although Archaeopteryx was found in these fossil beds, actually we'd been finding pterosaurs there for way, way, way longer. And in particular, both Rampharynchus and other Rampharynchoids and Pterodactylus and other Pterodactyloids. So you had actually both the early inverted commas type of pterosaur and the late inverted commas type of pterosaur living alongside each other and living alongside early birds. And we've now got at least a couple of these weird recently discovered intermediate pterosaurs living alongside. So actually you've got all three groups alongside each other in the same time and same place. So is the reason you got loads of ty- like lots of flappy types of um, animals in this area because the ground was large? and they had to jump um, <laughs> in between so they didn't land and it, die. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's more a classic case of preservation. You know, pterosaurs are one of these groups where the bones are so thin they just don't preserve unless the conditions are just right and the conditions are just right. And that's why you also get feathers on Archaeopteryx and feathers on other dinosaurs. Oh. And Solnhofen has stuff like jellyfish preserved. <gasps> that's not the kind of thing which usually survives into the fossil record. So yeah, extensive beds of fossil jellyfish. In fact, well, <laughs> I mean, more than than half a jellyfish is extensive I would say yeah but the fact that the, you know there's not like two or three there's there's dozens and I, I knew a, I knew a girl who did her girl adult woman who did her PhD on Solnhofen jellyfish you know there was enough to do like a whole PhD on them wow uh, sorry I'm just I'm just trying to guess over the fact that I I think in my head I might have seen one of these like not in my head obviously using my eyes um like on the <laughs> internet and I I just one of the I think I, I've got because I've got an image in my head of them and I'm just like and in my head I'd go well that's fake and I didn't because <laughs> obviously it's fake it's like a kind of they're usually like a circular blob with four little blobs inside in a rough square which is actually what a lot of jellyfish look yeah. like from above um, but yeah a- absolutely incredible and there's insects and sharks and cuttle um, well squid and, and all kinds of again soft things that wouldn't usually preserve but there's a hell of a lot of pterosaurs um, I mean and this is why Ramford Rhynchus is has become such a well-known animal. Um, it's by far the most numerous pterosaur that we find. First pterosaurs dug up in the late 1700s. Wow. In Solnhofen. And, you know, we're still pulling them out today. And Rampharynchus, there's... See, I've got a database now of something like 150 specimens. Of course you do. And th- those are the ones just in public collections. And there's plenty in private hands as well. Okay. And remember that this is exceptional preservation. A very high number of those 150 plus specimens are complete and articulated. They're whole skeletons. We're not talking about bits. We're talking about skeletons. I'd say over a hundred of them, you've got three quarters plus of the animal. Mostly squidged flat, of course, because that's the common problem that you have with these. 2D. Not as bad as you think. And certainly our few are near enough 3D or are truly 3D. Uh, And at least what you do get with Rampharynchus, which you don't with a bunch of other pterosaurs, is that between all the specimens, we've got them in lots of different orientations. So, like, if you, if you if you think of like that mental picture of what Archaeopteryx looks like, you know, with like the head turned to the side and the and the arms outsplayed, all the Pterodactylus specimens look like that as well. They have almost the exact same pose. Rampharynchus, you get it on its front, you get it on its back, you get it on its side. Much more floppy. Um, yeah, but that's obviously really useful because it means you see the underside on some and the top side on others, and like you can you can find Rampharynchus skulls in almost every single view, which is really unusual. And so this is why I'd say it is the best known spe- pterosaur because we don't just have loads and loads and loads of specimens, but a bunch of 3D ones and at least multiple different views for the others. And then, of course, inevitably got tons of soft tissue as well. There's loads of wings. There's throat pouches. There's <gasps> beaks. There's claws. There's tail veins. Pretty much everything. So describe to me what it looks like because I know it's about, you know, like say a metre wingspan. It's about the size of a crow. Oh, no, 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 no. That's just the smallest one. Sorry, I got wrong. No, they're bigger than that yeah so so th- again this is a common thing it's like you you will often see in kids books like oh Rampharynchus wingspan of about a meter most of them are that kind of size there are some down to about 30 40 centimeters what? the biggest one that we've got is about one meter 85 one meter 88 that's, something like that that's that's big that's albatross yeah, level, it's, isn't it? it's yeah it's massive yeah. so it it is I, i'll be very careful with my words from depending on quite when this episode comes out it is by far the biggest described 
um, non pterodactyloid non pterodactyloid pterosaur. Um, and it is, and, it, and I should emphasise just how massive it is because the next biggest Ramphorhynchus Inca specimen we've got is about one meter forty. So that jump, you know, one meter forty is like the big one, and then you can add like thirty percent onto that. It's like it's quite a big jump up. Um, and that one is at the Natural History Museum in London, and it's one of the pseudo three D ones. So it's not quite perfect three D, but it's not crushed flat. And the skull is very, very nice. Um, so I'm, I'm supposed to be working on that with Mark Witten. I say supposed to be. We've done quite a bit of description on it and a, and a fair bit of work. And Mark Graham, the preparator at the Natural History Museum, who I think has just retired. But Mark and indeed the other curators at the NHM were basically giving us Mark's time were good enough to do some extra preparatory work on it because it had been like slapped together with a bunch of plaster in like the late 1800s to kind of hold it together covering up quite a lot of interesting features on this giant Ramphorhynchus. We're like, can, can, can you like take all that rubbish off and then take some more rock off and, and try and expose it? And in a few places it turned out to be annoyingly fragile and it didn't do any damage, but like we'd have loved to him to go further. But Mark was able to clean up a whole bunch of little bits and areas, which yeah, no one's ever seen on an animal this size. And therefore, at some point, when we eventually get a description out, it'll be quite inter- interesting and informative. But yeah, b- big Ramphorhynchus are getting on for two metres. Wow. That is a very sizable animal. And again, when the, where there's this concept that Ramphorhynchoids are little and a metre or less, well, some of them weren't. Excellent. So what about... Now, we all know pterosaurs. They have silly stuff on their heads quite a lot of the time. You mentioned mm. already, like, it, it's got throat pouches and things. So what... what did it have any of these features? Is it uh, what? What did it look like? You've got, as I say, so you've got a relatively small head. You know, compared to things like Quetzalcoatlus and all the other pterodactyloids, where the head's often longer than the body. Here, you've got a head that's about the same size as the neck, which is about the same size as the torso. So, a big head in the grand scheme of vertebrates, but compared to later but pterosaurs, sort of like, I'm thinking more like pelicany. Um, no, so more like you know, fairly typical birdie. You oh, okay. know, you, you talked about gulls. You know, in those kinds kinds of proportions of the head neck body not a million miles off okay. though with lots of big spiky fang teeth lovely but they have teeth and a beak which people always think is really weird but as our dinosaur listeners will know all ornithischians basically have a beak and teeth this isn't very strange at all for fossil animals yeah but it's a type it's a type of teeth isn't it because like you know the ornithischians have a beak but they have like crunchy teeth that go up and yeah. down and they don't grind obviously because they don't go sideways but that yeah. that more familiar thing whereas when you've got a beak which is kind of a stabby grippy thing and then spiky teeth which are stabby grippy things you kind of go you're overdoing it yeah. here that's too much you're wearing a low cut top and you've got your legs out that's just too much <laughs> An analogy I hadn't considered with the pterosaur <laughs> jaw anatomy, but we, we can go with it. Um, but yeah, so, so but the beak at the front, so it's just the tip of the jaw and it's kind of long and slightly curved. So Ramphorhynchus more or less translates as kind of like prow beak or prow f- snout. Sorry, plough snout. Plow so in other snout. words, you've got that kind of plough share or, you know, trireme, for, you know, front of one of the the Greek ramming ships, that kind of oh, yeah, yeah. sloping down and pointing out. So you've got that extension of the nose. And then these very long, thin, kind of fang-like teeth that slightly point forward and out and would kind of intersect as the mouth closed. So we think they're kind of, you know, grabbing fish close to the surface or just under the surface with that with that kind of scoop. not quite hook but scoop of a beak which is exactly the shape of the front of the beak in something like pteranodon in fact which is another animal we think it's fishing close to the surface but then it's got the teeth to kind of jam in and, and grab stuff afterwards um, it's making me think this li- isn't the most beautiful of animals I've got images of like deep sea fish here like the anglerfish yeah, with the teeth and the that kind of thing actually yeah um, and the, yeah and you know at least we know they're eating fish because there are several with fish inside wow. them um, it's probably not just fish they're eating. So I described a specimen, which is from Germany, but held in, in Canada uh, about well, five, six years ago, uh, that had two interesting features. So first of all, it had some bones in the chest cavity, which we were never able to really establish what they were, only to say that they're probably not fish bones. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple of ver- fish, fish vertebrae are usually quite distinctive and they don't look like fish vertebrae. A bunch of people have seen this. We showed photos to everyone. We've we've trawled through museum drawers. It's the kind of thing where it's like, 
we'll ask the crocodile people, we ask the bird people, we ask the fish people, we ask the amphibian people, we ask the lizard people, because we you know all these things are in and around the Solenhof, and you know any of these things could have been grabbed. And the the general consensus is probably not fish. But it still meant that it's eating some non-fish I've things. I've had some meals like that before, so... Yeah, you know. yeah. So that was at the front half, and then at the back half, so sitting just beyond where the cloaca would have been, was a very obvious little mass of stuff. A poo? Um, it, there was a coprolite, yeah. So oh. it's a, a, a coprolite in association with a pterosaur. And again, that had a whole bunch of tiny little hook-like spikes in it. And again, we went through a whole bunch of options for these and spoke to a lot of different people. We originally thought they were squid hooks. A lot of um, well, cephalopods have like little... Well, have those really scary hooks, don't they? Because you see them on yeah. sperm whales. Sperm whales go really deep in the ocean. Yeah. And they battle. They must battle these squids because these squids just claw... You can see them on, on the nose of the of the whale, these huge claws that, that and scars. And you're just like, oh yeah. my gosh, what are they doing down there? Yeah, lo- lo- loads of cephalopods have really serious hooks in their arms, including Amazon. There are some fossil ammonites which preserve them all, and they're absolutely incredible. Um, so that's what we thought they were, but we showed it to a bunch of ammonite and cephalopod people, and they're like, no, nah, not sure. I do have, uh, like, it- I don't know if you've seen the TV series Bojack Horseman, where you have different people with different heads. So Bojack himself has a horse of it, so I head, seen it. and his friend <laughs> has got a dog's head, and they're just normal people, but they've got different heads. When you say things like the fish people and the ammonite people, <laughs> right. this is what I'm picturing, just <laughs> so you know. I imagine you in the Bojack Horseman universe <laughs> with everybody with their own little special. Anyway, carry on. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we spoke to Ammonite cephalopod people. Uh, we thought it might be some kind of snail. That may sound weird, but snails and other mollusks have a thing called a radula. So they have a little, like, tongue-like thing with a whole bunch of little hooks on it, which is what they used to rasp away at food with. So we thought it might be one of them. Didn't really show up. We looked at a bunch of other invertebrates that have some odd little hooks and defensive spines in them. And and again, everyone we spoke to said, I don't think it's my group. Try the next group. Um, everyone was very happy that there's some kind of invertebrate spines, but we just don't know what. So on the one hand, very frustrating. But on the other hand, you know, Ramphorhynchus is absolutely typecast as the fish eater. And we've got one that was eating A, some kind of marine invertebrate and B, some kind of tetrapod. So they're not just eating fish. Imagine, though, that there was a species, a whole little branch of nature that had these little spikes over them that, that doesn't fit into any mm. particular bracket and this is one of the last ever you know <laughs> you know thing and it's in somebody's poo that would be yes. you know this is the like one little sort of like you know branch of mother nature's evolutionary journey and the only evidence we have on it is in a poo there, there are a couple of fossils like that where species are named as stomach contents in other species <laughs> that's the only time we've ever found it is having been eaten by something else um, so it does occur. Wow, that's amazing. Um, but go- but going back to your questions quite some time ago before we got onto diet, um, head crest. So there are a bunch of pterosaurs. In fact, there's a thing called Pterorhynchus. Is that the one with a massive aerial that's bigger than its body? No, but ter- Pterorhynchus is interesting because it's a it was the first non pterodactyloid to turn up with a he- with an obvious head crest. Uh, but also that obvious head crest is soft tissue with no obvious bony attachment. Oh. Because we've got some, so Pterodactylus is a good example of that, where we had a whole bunch of good skeletons, and you can see this little kind of ridge of spiky bone along the middle of the nose. And it was only later when we found some really good ones that you saw that that actually was like an anchor to hold soft tissue on top. And you're like, okay, fair enough, that makes sense. The soft tissue is attached to the bone, and that's what holds it to the head. Pterorhynchus has the head crest, but without the bony bit. And of course, that then belies the question, well, if you can have a big crest without the bony bit, how many of the ones known just from skeletons still have something on top of them? Ramphorhynchus, I'd contend, probably doesn't. Um, partly because we've got a bunch of really good specimens and there's still no sign of a head crest. On the flip side, we know a bunch of those, you know, most of these specimens were discovered well over a century ago and a lot of people took off a lot of stuff that they shouldn't have done back then because bones were the only interesting thing and who cares about that mess that doesn't look very nice even if it's probably a wing or something. 
Um, but we've we've got enough good ones since that I'm personally I think it's about eighty twenty in favour of it not having had a head crest. So it probably doesn't. What it does have though is this little tail fan. So the long bony tail. The tail is as long as the head to base of tail. Length. So it's quite easy to draw. This is what I'm getting. If you want to draw it, if the head's the same as the neck, same as the torso, same as the tail, that's quite a you know. Well, head, head neck, and torso would be the same as the tail. Oh, okay, okay. So long. So it's, it's a tail. it's a long tail. Yeah. So long, yeah, these are long tailed pterosaurs. This is traditionally what they've been called, and Ramphricus again is being like this emblematic animal of that. Um, unusual uh, in that the tail has these stiffening rods running down it. So they have these greatly elongate little filigrees of bone, which normally just overlap and give you a little articulation point. And in these, they're enormous. And that is massively convergent with dromaeosaurs. In fact, there was a paper by um, Scott Persons, Canadian paleontologist, that he wrote with Victoria Arbor and Phil Curry about the convergence between Ramphorhynchus and a few other animal tails close to Ramphorhynchus and dromaeosaurs. They're almost identical in what they've done to grow these bony rods and make the tail stiff. Because I remember you saying about uh, Velociraptor, because Velociraptor, because it, it had this, when it was fighting, I think you pointed out that it had this really stiff tail when it was fighting the, um, oh, what were they called? Protoceratops. Yes, exactly. Well, that's the thing. So that there's this idea that dromaeosaurs have this, like, broomstick handle tail, that it's just, you know, solid. And it's not at all, because you find dromaeosaurs with quite a degree of flexion in the tail. Remember, people think that bone is this horribly brittle structure because they're used to dealing with dried bones, or they're used to dealing with fossils which are, you know, not mechanically, you know, mechanically different and are not living tissue anymore. Wet, living bone is really quite flexible. Um, And so these tails would have been very greatly stiffened. That doesn't mean that they're just, you know, a stick, that they not, they, they could flex and these these so these tails were stiff end but flexible and Ramphorhynchus has this little um, vein at the end um, it's often been described as leaf like and it does look like a leaf um, though in big ones it's much more of a uh, equilateral triangle with a flat back so kind of like an arrowhead pointing towards the head and there's been two big questions about this over the over the uh, decades, you know, centuries even at this point. What orientation does that have? So is that up and down like a, a plain rudder, mm. or is it actually flat. side to side and, and flat? And, so is it like a up, shark yeah. or a dolphin? That's what. Yes, there you go. That's a good one. And then what on earth is it for? And the assumption is that the function had always been something aero, aerodynamic. You know, these are flying animals. And they've got a stiffened tail. You stick a rudder at the end of it. And mechanically, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, when you put something at the end of a long rod, it has a much greater effect and it doesn't need to be as big. Um, when I first got into pterosaur flight, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I, had a, I had a plan for a pterosaur flight project and I went up to speak to the aero engineers because we had quite a big aero engineering department. <laughs> So I knocked on a few doors until I found someone who's willing to talk to the, you know... The weird boy. <laughs> PhD student paleontologist. Go, Can we talk about... To, huh? And so one, one guy was like, oh, this is cool. You know, bioengineering. Yeah, love this stuff. Let, let's have a chat. And I showed him some photos of what I was working on and specimens. And I showed him the tail vein of Ramphorhynchus. And he went, give me a second. Ruffled through some drawers and pulled out this, this drawing. And he went, this was a design for a next generation drone that I submitted to the Ministry of Defence last year. And his design for the tail vein was this big, long, thin spar at the end with a little triangle right at the end of it. Amazing. And this is why people think it's mechanical, because it does a lot of jobs like that. It is relatively lightweight, and yet it has a big mechanical advantage because it's long and thin. So if you're flying, this is what you want. Maximum deviation for minimum effort. But we know, Dave, nature doesn't do the easy stuff. It does the stuff that is massively random. And we know that it's got this terribly ugly face. So it's going to want to distract from that in order to attract mates, surely. Well, so this is is where we're going. So the first thing is, what orientation did that sit in? Mm. Uh, And that you'd think that'd be really easy to say. But of course, remember, lots of these things are crushed. They're all at slightly weird angles. And something that thin and flat is going to be flattened and rotated very easily. Easily. So it'd be very actually, impossible. even though we had a dozen good specimens with tail veins, impossible to say quietly how it had or hadn't been flattened. The answer to that question really came because a bunch of them are fairly asymmetrical. Like the top bit is bigger than the bottom bit. And I'm now using top and bottom because that's the orientation we, th- we think it occurs in. And that's why, because if this was side to side and the two sides are rather uneven, 
that's not really very good for steering. That's going to constantly cant you left or right, depending on which side is bigger and which side is smaller. Whereas if it's vertical, that, that might give you a little bit of up and down cant, but not very much because it's your wings which are really doing that. So they're more like sharks and dolphins. Yeah, and indeed, of course, if you are, your wings are very good for going up and down. What you probably want more help with is turning sideways, and that is what a rudder is good for. So it made a lot more sense that this was vertically orientated than horizontal. So we're at least happy with the orientation. And then it becomes, well, it does it still function as some kind of flying device or steering device? Or is it something else in particular, a display structure? That's the, you know, usually an obvious thing to go to. And even though it makes mechanical sense to do it this way round, there's a couple of reasons to think that it's actually not just mechanical or certainly not purely mechanical. One of which is, again, like the head crest, because head crests and pterosaurs were often said to be some kind of steering device or, or counterweight or some kind of mechanical thing. And the, the answer is, then why are they all so different? Mm. Why are they so different to each other? Because if there's one easy, simple mechanical solution to turning, surely they're all going to evolve more or less the same thing from the same body plan. And when many of them are descendants from each other or certainly starting from the same genetic kit and living in the same environment, surely the selection pressures are the same on all of them they'll all do the same thing well um well okay i'm just gonna i'm just gonna put in but what if because you love that about me right but what if yeah <laughs> so we do have lots of birds with different styles of wing i know they don't really have that much tails but different styles of wing, depending on the type of flight they're doing which does depend on the sort of like not the big environment but the micro environment so birds who go in like trees tend to have smaller you know uh, length of wing and that sort of thing birds that tend to fly up tend to have a big you know the, you know the environment that a, an e, like a, a red kite and a blue tit live in are the same but there's a lot of difference in that but what they're actually doing with their flight so that's potentially true for some terrestrial animals but remember we most pterosaurs are found in marine sediments ah, because that's where they preserve better there aren't any trees well where and so that's the thing when you're talking about big oceanic things like pteranodon and ornithochirus which are spending most of their time, you know, 200 miles plus out to sea, they're pretty much encountering the same system all the time. Um, so so that's potentially, you know, that's a fairly big problem with that. Um, so yeah, go, going back to the tail veins, yeah, I've, I've already said that, you know, in Renfrancus we've got these little leaf-shaped ones and then we've got these triangular ones. They're not the only ones out there. There are two other relatively good tail veins that we have. They're very, very rare for pterosaurs, actually. Um, one is Sordes. Um, this beautiful swordies, the hairy swordies pelosus, the hairy devil. It's a beautiful thing from uh, Kazakhstan. <laughs> I think I went out with him once. Yes. Um, so swordies is the reason that we knew pterosaurs had pycno fibers, these feather-like filaments on their body. You know, swordies has been around since the fifties. I want to say something like that. Several specimens, all well preserved, all with this filament, and one of them has a good tail vein. And it's like an oar. It's a it's a relatively long paddle. It's a third of the length of the tail, so a good percentage of the tail length. Um, and, you know, just long and flat and not too deep and rounded at the end. So that's very different from either of the two Ramphorhynchus shapes. And then the other one, Terrorhynchus, which we mentioned not long ago with the head crest, also has a tail vein. It's similar in shape to that of uh, Sordes, but it's sawtoothed, top and bottom. Ooh. So it's like a little pair of, like, kiddie drawing of mountain ranges. Amazing. And they're slightly offset. So again, they're asymmetrical. The top is, the top is offset. So the peak of one lines with the trough of the one below. Like, like a sound wave, she says. Because she's going to yeah. have to edit this interview in a bit. But yes. yeah. <laughs> um, so that was never been properly described. Um, there are some photos of it out there. So people know about it. Um, but I don't think I've ever seen that photo published. Um, and that's, and as you may remember from the Scandosauri up to Rigid's, episode um this terrorinkus is also from the collection of steven sezerkus who owned scansori opta x and therefore this questionably obtained questionable legal status the original description was in a self-published paper edited by his wife 
But how was he? How was he involved in Dinosaur Nineteen uh, Dinosaur Planet Nineteen Seventy Seven? He was the he was he was the he was the animator. He did the dinosaur so models. He's and an amazing them. animator. We we yeah. For those of you who don't know, we released over Christmas um, a special Christmas Day treat, which we weren't planning <laughs> to do as a sort of live thing. But I made it live, even though Dave was not wearing any makeup. It was terribly embarrassing for him. But um, and you know, hadn't cleaned his flat or anything like that. So everything, yeah. But both of our houses were a tip. But you could see your ceiling so it didn't matter anyway point mm. is that we dissected dinosaur planet um the movie and we did a little commentary and you can if you're a patron you can go and watch this on youtube in, if you wish uh but yes but the point being that this guy okay i'm, I'm not gonna say anything bad about um his science because his animation is beautiful and what's more important dave animation that's right yeah <laughs> but but anyway so so i as i say i'm not like letting some big science scientific secret out of the bag with this Terrorinkus tale, but it's one of those annoying things in science where it's like not quite apocryphal because I've seen photos of this tale and I know Chris Bennett has seen it and he told me about it, but there's nothing published and no one knows where the specimen is and God knows what's going to happen with it and yeah. Um, but we have multiple Ramphorinkoid tails with all different vein shapes on them. And again, so if this is a purely mechanical structure, that's not what you'd expect. And indeed, we have young and older Ramphorinkus with different tail vein shapes on them, which is is not the kind of thing yeah. you'd expect if it's purely mechanical because Ramphorhynchus is very interesting in terms of its growth and I want to talk about that in a little of bit. Of course you do. Of course you do, Dave. Of course. Well, that's that's been, a, you know, as I said, it's an interesting animal with lots of interesting things going for it and the fact that we know so much about it is makes it that important. Um, but yeah, so an obvious counter is, well, is this a display structure? It varies between different species. It varies even within species. This is not what you'd expect it for something mechanical. It varies between young and old. So like, you know, it, it could be getting like more attractive as it ages. Yep. So as part of a paper that I did um, with a guy called Devin O'Brien in the States, there's about 12 of us as, as co-authors, about how structures grow and develop um, and looking at sexual selection... Um, I measured all of the known um, Ramphorhynchus tail veins. Of course he did. You measured them all. No, there's not There's not that many of them. Yeah, it took a while to hunt them down. Um, Julian Kiley, a paleontologist who's doing his master's now, I think, in Portsmouth, helped me out with some of that early on when he did a little internship with me. Um, and eventually we managed to get more of the data together and I was able to find some more stuff and then put it together, did this little analysis and basically was able to show that admittedly for a very limited number of specimens, Ramphorhynchus's tail vein shows the same growth pattern as we see in sexually selected structures in other animals. Namely, it doesn't do very much for a while and then suddenly gets very big wow. when they hit adulthood. Exactly what you'd predict. So that at the bare minimum suggests that tail veins are functioning as a display structure. As I always keep saying, that doesn't mean that they weren't being used for steering because they are still present in the juveniles it does make sense to have something like that at the end of a tail. These things were locking around with tails for a hundred million years. The tail's probably doing something. Um, but it also it also makes sense that you know what animals. I know that you have really extreme examples like peacocks, where the tail you think that can't offer any sort of function. But a lot of the traits that animals it does it does. Oh look, you got excited. No, there. no, no, because because peacocks don't have a massive tail. This is a oh, no, massive no, misconception. A massive, yeah, they got. They have a train, tail, but yeah. The 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 thing that peacocks lift up and turn into a giant fan are back feathers, which is why when you see them, it's just a head and then the fan because it's off, it's virtually off the shoulders. If you turn one of those things around, you can see its back and then its tail, and it it's got a fairly normal pheasant like tail, quite big. But the the big thing that they put up is not a tail. Okay, it's off their back. They're raising yeah. their hackles at you. But the point being, you can see why that offers very little function. I mean, it might yeah. startle a predator, but I don't think it is yeah, mainly there to dazzle peaheads. Yeah. So that that's its purpose. Whereas there are a lot of other things which offer both sexual selection and also advantage, like size. Oh, yeah. There are lots of males and females which are larger size and therefore more attractive. Oh, yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm agreeing 100% with that. Yeah, it's, you know, multifunctionality is absolutely a thing. Sexual selection can be the sole driving function of amazing features. But very often there is co-option. 
I I am pretty sure that ramphorhynchoid tail veins were functioning in steering to a certain degree. But what's driving the exact size and shape of those tail veins is almost certainly some kind of display. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the variation and the growth patterns that we do. Okay, so what sort of display are we seeing? Because at the moment, you're just describing a little sort of triangular and not a uniform triangular sort of you know thing at the end. Would they have had like filaments in there? Would it have had so that we we see some little kind of of dark stripes in them and whether that's thickening or even a bit of to give it some strength or or some actual pigment or traces of previous pigment or blood vessels don't know a lot of them are just impressions rather than the actual original material and as I say there's not very many of you know there's something like 10 you know and at least three of them are impressions and at least a couple of them are not very well preserved so you're down to you know a handful of specimens that show any kind of structure Um, I've just thought of something Dave no reason to think they wouldn't be bright coloured or stripy or could blush with blood or something. I, okay, where's this I, going? I, I, I've thought of something. I, I, know that, I know that look. I've, I've thought of it, yes. right? Yes. Say you're Amphorhynchus and you've got this like, almost like this like lure at the end of your tail, right? This is kind of stripy, mm. a bit fish-like maybe. And what you do is you fly really close to the surface of the water and you dip it in the water and then other bigger fish come up to the surface thinking, oh, what's that? And then just before they bite your tail, which you magically know about using your spider powers, right? You turn around and grab them. Although that's obviously nonsense, you <laughs> are probably unaware of a thing called Aspidorhynchus. I am I am unaware of a thing called Aspidorhynchus. So, Aspidorhynchus. Aspidorhynchus is a pretty sizable fish that you get in the Solnhofen. Over a metre long, I think, for the big ones. Wow. Uh, or even bigger than that. And there is one described specimen, but I believe there are at least three three specimens of Aspidorhynchus biting a Ramphorhynchus. So three specimens of Ramphorhynchus are known stuck in the mouth of an Aspidorhynchus. So big fish were biting these pterosaurs. Whether they took them on the wing and jumped out of the water and grabbed them, which we know some fish are capable of, modern fish, I suspect that was extraordinarily rare and it was more likely that they were grabbing them on the surface. You know, I've done work on floating postures of pterosaurs and... Pterosaurs float really well because they're very, very pneumatic. But because they've got short little inflexible necks, they float with their head on the surface and they can't lift it up like a bird does, which is probably bad long term. Um, well, get water in their ears. Among other things, um, I, I, you know, again, people, people have hilariously misinterpreted my paper on that repeatedly. I'm not suggesting that they couldn't float. I'm not suggesting that they couldn't swim. I'm not suggesting that as soon as they hit the surface, they drowned. They could take off from the surface fine. But on average, it's probably not a good thing for a pterosaur compared to the average bird. And obviously, if it was really stormy and wavy conditions, that's going to make life tougher. And in the way in which seagulls just sit on the surface and just bob with the waves, basically immune to it, I don't think pterosaurs did that very well. So they are going to be more vulnerable to drowning or to struggling and then being grabbed by something like a big fish which sees a pterosaur sat on the surface and it looks like a meal. I have another theory. You're going (laughs) to... I'm full of them today. It's amazing, right? Okay, so say like you develop this kind of really exciting tale and that you're also somehow related to a gecko or one of the slow worms types that can lose their tail, right, if it gets attacked. Then if you're well, on the, the, one, surf- the ones that are bone- bound together with all the extra rods of bone that we talked about. Yeah, so say right, just checking. that those like magically you could just think and they'd just fall off if a fish came and bit the tail and then you could flap away uh, when when your tail's been bitten off because it looks more exciting than you do with your weird stabby face. Well, in that case, we'd find them without tails. And in fact, the tails don't fall off. Oh. So this was a paper I did a few years ago. Um, See, so it's not Sue that Beardmore. silly idea, is it, if you did a paper on it? Well, we, we looked at the decay patterns of them and the tail is one of the last things to fall off. And if it had a pre-designed mm. weak point or pre-evolved weak point, you'd think it would come off very easily. Yeah. And it said it doesn't. Okay, well, that it was just a theory, Dave. You have to... Yes. Science needs people yes. to pose these theories in order to justify yes. its existence. And, and and now we're going to have a little exchange about what a theory is because oh, if there's oh, yeah, one yeah, no, thing no, no, that no, no, grinds no. my gears it's the phrase oh it's just a theory. Yeah, no, this is just my pet theory. theory. Of evolution it is um, an izzy theory hmm. meaning it was a hypothesis. It was a hypothesis. But I, I, to be honest Dave I wouldn't even credit it with that. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, true, true, actually, because generally a hypothesis is based on an observation of data, whereas this is just something you it's made something up. Something that my not mate even told that. Me. And 
so experience this, with slow worms. So, so, so in fact, this is not even a hypothesis. No, it is. It is um, a pub chat. That's what it is. If if the universe could stop saying this is my theory or this yes. is a theory, or maybe just science. Or what's just the come current up with a theory on theory for the a different word but, for the word theory? Yes, or maybe people should actually find out what words mean before they use them. I prefer law, to be fair, but it, like evolution can't be a law for reasons I don't understand. But well, no. So we 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 do have laws in so we have laws and rules in science. Um, so laws tend to stick to maths and physics, where it's something in theory at least inviable. Mm. You know. Momentum is conserved. That is a law, I believe, or energy is conserved. It just is. You, you can't not do that. There are no exceptions. Um, rules are things which are very often true, but not necessarily true. Um, but rules I don't think evolution... Rules are to be yeah. Yes. Uh, but evolution doesn't quite count as either, because it's not an invite... Because things, at least in theory, need not evolve if the situation was right. Stagnant. Um, I mean, it's almost important, you know, because the, 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 cur- the generally given definition these days is a change in allele frequency over time oh, yeah. which means that even if even if you have a purely clonal population of something sooner or later there will be mutations and therefore the appearance of that will change over time and so you still got evolution a proper evolution mm. episode or even a couple of episodes to really we can we can we can do we can get onto that later but in the short term can everyone just stop calling any random idea however insane it is a theory because it call, drives me you up you should the call wall. it an thought Yes, yes, particularly everyone on Reddit. Now, um, <laughs> so, um, Ramfrinkus tail veins, and then I muttered about growth. So this is, you know, a great... So Ramfrinkus has been known for I said, a long, long time. You know, the, the earliest specimens turning up in the late 1700s, early 1800s. You know, they've been around for well over 200 years at this point. Um, and as with all things, we've discussed this with dinosaurs before. Initially, every single specimen you dig up, new species, new species, new species. At one point, we had like, oh, I don't know, 15 species of Ramphorhynchus or something ridiculous. Um, and Peter Vellenhofer, who... Has an excellent... Very, if you, it is. If, if, you, if you're not a pterosaur biologist, you very rarely hear about Vellenhofer. And he's just the absolute god of pterosaur research and, and deserves... Um, it's not that he doesn't get the credit, it's just that people outside the field don't know, you know, you don't have to know much about dinosaurs to have heard about John Ostrom and Backer and Horner and Phil Curry and people like this. Is like, Belmhofer was, I would argue, more important than any of those people combined for pterosaur research. Um, so he was a, a German researcher, he only retired a few years ago, um, say a few from 2005, um, but, you know, in the, it, people forget, you know, the dinosaur renaissance really changed paleontology, not just dinosaurs, but, you know, drove a lot of interest in that in general, so that, that wave in like the 70s, 80s, from like the 1930s to the 1970s, paleo- not a lot was happening in paleontology, and not even in dinosaurs. And so groups like pterosaurs, even less so. And there were some people doing little bits and bobs here and there. But really, the person who did, like, all pterosaur research for about 30 years in the middle was Peter Vellenhofer. Um, In Munich... So, obviously, in the centre of these collections, um, he's most famous for the fact that he did a bunch of stuff on Archaeopteryx because they had Archaeopteryx specimens available and there were not a lot of people working on any of these things. But So people are like, oh, Archaeopteryx, that's important. They'd ignore the pterosaur stuff. Um, but in 1970 and 1973, he published a pair of monographs, like 100 plus pages of text with dozens of photos and dozens of illustrations that he did by hand. And they are immaculate. Like, everyone still cites these. Everyone still copies these figures. They're just brilliant. And Peter had seen not just all the Ramphorinkus and Pterodactylus and associated stuff from the Solhofen. Pterosaurs were such a small subject. He'd seen almost everything um, at a time when, okay, there were lots of fragments sitting in collections, but this is before the big stuff came out of Brazil, before all the stuff came out of China. Peter had seen, like, almost everything. <laughs> um and so when, when, when he writes a book, and I say, sad, sadly, and I mean, there's no disrespect to him in German, um, would have been nice if he'd done it in English, and his English was immaculate, having met him several times. Um, but, you know, when, when he writes, you know, oh, well, this, this is this feature in this group of pterosaurs, it bloody was, because he'd seen basically all of them, and he spent decades on these works. Um, but anyway, getting slightly off track, so Peter did absolutely monumental studies, and one of the things he did was shrink Ramphorhynchus down from 15-odd species down to four, basically. Wow. And said, you've got a little one, a mid-sized one, a biggish one, and a couple of giants. And that's more or less what's out there. And he had a bunch of characters 
to see. What they all had in common things, tail vein shape and skull shape and a bunch of other things like this. And that solved a lot of problems. But some, at least some of his characters were fairly obviously questionable. Like he talked about how fused the pelvis was. Well, young animals don't have fused pelvis and adult animals do. And that's basically a universal. So that kind of, and, and similar, it's like fusion of the shoulder girdle, which for a flying animal is really important. And so like, that kind of implies that a bunch of these characters for your small species are not small features at all. They're juvenile features. That, that, that's a lack of fusion in anything else we'd call that a juvenile. Um, and Chris Bennett, amazing paleontologist in, in the US at Fort Hay State University in uh, Kansas. Um, Chris did a lovely analysis in 1996. In fact, he did a pair in 1995 and 96. He did one of Ramphorinkus and one of Pterodactylus. Um, basically getting all the specimens together, measuring a whole bunch of features of them. In fact, digging them out of Peter's own tables. I, I'm working on a pterosaur paper at the moment. And the first thing that I did was open up Fellenhofer's two monographs and start translating his data. Stuff now... 55 years old and it's the best measurement data set of pterosaurs available it's it's that important um chris took peter's data set selected some key measurements from that did some uh little bit of maths on it and was able to show basically that some of those features well in addition to some of those features obviously being ontogenetic and linked to growth and just general development and fusion Also, some of them were kind of smeary. And when you said, oh, the small ones have this and the big ones have this, well, some of the smaller big ones have it and some of the bigger small Mm -hmm. ones have it. It's almost like there's a bit of blurring. Now, Peter was right in that there were some fairly distinctive size classes. But again, they overlapped a bit at the bottom as well. As in, you had these little peaks and troughs and they weren't entirely separate. Um, and so Chris's argument was that actually all of these things are the same thing. It is a growth series from juvenile to adult, small ones unfused, big ones fully fused, things like the tail vein shape changing over time um, and stuff like this. Uh, but the reason that you got relatively separate categories was that these are Solnhofen animals. And the Solnhofen lagoons, although we think of them as being very tropical and very Mediterranean, I think that's a good analogy for the climate and the overall style of it was seasonal and very stormy. Mm. And if you're a young flying animal living around cliffs and waters, you're probably going to get killed in storms occasionally. And you're probably going to be more vulnerable as a juvenile than an adult. And those storms only occur for a couple of months every year. And those will be the majority of your deaths. So what you're effectively seeing are year groups with your separation because they're being killed every, well, we'll call it December, January. I don't know when it was, but you know, okay, so there's a big storm and it will kill off the ones that are 10 months old and the ones that are 22 months old and the ones that are 34 months old. And so you'll tend to get these relatively discrete divisions. Um... And so this was a really important, you know, shift in our understanding that, no, there are not four or five species here. There's actually one. And we now have a complete growth series of 150 odd specimens um, of this species. What I like about that, too, is it kind of gives you an idea that they were probably breeding seasonally as well. So they weren't they weren't like, you know, rats yeah. and pigs and us who just breed whenever we feel like it. But they have distinct seasons, which most animals do. People miss this e- even in tropical latitudes where, you know, the it is very little seasonality. Most things still have a time of year where they tend to breed and a time of year where they don't. Um, so, yeah, we absolutely would expect that. Um, so, yeah, so that was a fairly big shift in our understanding of Ramphorinkus. Yeah, we've now got a giant growth series of hundreds of specimens. We can unify all their anatomy to put them together and, you know, translate and cross-reference all this stuff. That allowed us to do some more interesting things about looking at their growth. So I published a paper just last year with a bunch of colleagues looking at this. And we're able to show that actually Ramphorinkus is incredibly isometric in its growth. What does Um, isometric mean, Dave? So it basically means that they look almost identical as juveniles as they do at adults. You know, if you look at babies of most things, they've got big heads. Big eyes. Big eyes, big hands and feet. And then, yeah, and then they kind of grow into it. Uh, so that is allometry. So some things are growing faster than others. And we've talked about allometry on here before because actually head crests and things like that, they show positive allometry. They go very, very fast. Ramphorinkus is weird as hell in that it is basically isometric. You can take a tiny 50 centimeter wingspan and a giant one meter 50 wingspan. So an animal three times bigger. And it just looks like you zoomed in on it. Yeah, they're within like a couple of percentage points. Because I was going to say that, like, you know, crocodiles are a bit like that. And then they're, actually they're not, because the baby crocodiles have got big eyes and they're kind of, you know, they're, they're actually They don't cute. have that long a nose. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, it, it they do change. So the so there's a couple of things which are similar to this. One is fish, actually. So a lot of fish are very similar. Not all, but a lot of them are very similar at different sizes. Um, and uh, I should say not everything is perfectly isometric in pterosaurs. Some are more varied than others. The eyes are negatively allometric. So the babies do have really big eyes and then they shrink. Uh, well, they don't shrink, but proportionally. Yeah, yeah they so, stay so, yeah, similar. They, they, they don't grow as fast as the rest of the. Yeah, of the so they, they 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 do grow into their eyes. Would be a, mm. a way of, of, of putting it. Um, so yeah, uh, but uh, but another thing uh, that actually does something fairly similar is some of the super precocial birds. There are a handful of birds. They're very very rare, but they are out there that fly within days or even within hours of hatching out of the egg. And they grow nearly isometric. What are these birds like? Where do I find them? Um, so Mallee fowl is the are the classic ones. So these um, really interesting birds from um, Australia. Okay. Uh, it's always where the, weird the, eggs get, the eggs get buried in a big mound of, of rotting vegetation and the babies hatch out of that. Mom, so mum and dad, look, dad, I think in particular, looks after the nest. Um, I think you've mentioned these before they, somewhere when we were talking about nests. Yeah, because they're, cause they're quite interesting from the incubation point of view as well. Cool. So it's very, you know, so if you, and this is one of the reasons, and again, we've got this talking about my own research, but like I'm not the only person to have said this before. There's been another paper since um, saying something similar, but this is one of the arguments for young pterosaurs being able to fly is that, yeah, if you look at the growth pattern of things like gulls, uh, which has been done, or in our paper, we actually looked at bats as well because. They're an interesting parallel model. They're obviously way more differently related to pterosaurs, but they have membranous wings. They're quadrupedal, so they're doing some similar things in similar ways. You see, yeah, baby bats, really big feet and relatively big hands, but not the actual fingers that support the wing membrane. Why? Because when they are newborn, they need to grip onto mum or they need to grip onto the ceiling when mum's foraging. Hands and feet are really important in baby bats, particularly their feet, for you know, because they because they hang. And in pterosaurs, yeah, you, you get one out of the egg and it looks identical to the adult. So they have why to it got Why has it got dirty, great, long wings if it's not flying? Baby, You look at baby birds when they hatch. Tiny wings. Big head. Wings barely exist. Why? Why? Because they need to survive, and to survive they need to grow fast. And mum and dad is going to be cramming food down their throats until they get big enough to be okay. So they need the biggest beak in the nest bigger than their sisters. And they don't care about wings. They grow, 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 and suddenly they grow wings, and then they grow their feathers. And now they can start trying to fly. And bats effectively are doing something pretty similar, and pterosaurs are absolutely not doing that. And again, there's the one set of birds that don't as well, and it's, and it's the, uh, the hyperprecocial birds, birds that can fly almost out the egg, also have very big wings when they hatch, and grow their wings at a similar proportion to the rest of them. Wow. And so this is really cool. And therefore, another reason that actually probably all this Bramfrinkus are the same thing. Um, and again, allows us to do some interesting things. We've talked about niche separation before. So yes, juveniles are flying and are filling those small niches. Um, so that's probably why we're not finding super tiny adult pterosaurs, because then you'd have to have even tinier, tinier, tinier babies and things are probably starting to oh, break down so at that point. Oh, it's so cute though. It's so cute. It's so tiny. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, can you tell me, because I remember when we first brought up, when we, I, was it Tom Holland? Oh, no, it was Adam Rutherford, wasn't it? We were talking with, and he said that um, pterosaurs, so they, they, they lay their eggs on cliffs, because this is the sort yeah. of classic thing that, that we all classic, think. Yeah. yeah. So where do we know anything about where that... I mean, it suggests to me they were, if those babies could fly immediately. I mean... Maybe. So, so, so we have a we have a handful of pterosaur eggs. Actually, we have a bunch of new ones now have come up in China, but they haven't got a lot of description yet. Um, but they're all super, super thin shelled. Uh, they're not like bird eggs at all, or even like many reptile eggs. Um, and they'd be very vulnerable to desiccation. And the implication is you basically have to bury them with wet vegetation if they're going to develop. Um, suggest that they're laying eggs inland because uh, yeah, cliffs don't really provide that kind of shelter. I mean, some of them probably are. By the time you get to things like pteranodon these are big oceanic animals they'll have access to cliff faces and stuff i mean who knows quite what they're doing and of course there's no egg preservation because you're never going to get eggs from cliff nets <laughs> and that kind of 
Tyr- let alone one with a tr- baby pteranodon inside. Yada, 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 yada. This isn't necessarily universal, but all the ones that we do have are showing this very, very thin wall. But again, you, you, you're in that classic almost catch-22 in that the vast majority of our pterosaurs are marine animals and all our eggs are from the terrestrial species. So how well do the two compare directly to each other? Um, you know, it's like only ever finding desert tortoise eggs and then trying to work out what leatherback turtles do. I mean, the fact that they could, like, completely, like, get out of there quickly does suggest they are being eaten. Yeah, well, they probably are. But then, again, that again leads into interesting questions about parental care. Mm. Uh, you know, are the adults able to look after the nests? We know that with things like Malifowl, they do. We know with things like crocodiles, they do. So it's perfectly possible. Um, there was a paper a few years ago that suggested that um, if pterosaurs were... Um, hyper precocious if they were flying out of the egg or, or very soon afterwards there would be no parental care but I think that's not actually true because you do see you know alligators and crocodiles are a good example of that they're they're precocial in the sense that they're, they're, they're quite active uh, you know they're not like they're not some helpless droopy thing in the nest um, but they're certainly, you know, snapping after their own insect and fish. Mum isn't feeding them in that regard, but they're still being looked after. So there is parental care, even if they are foraging. So I don't think that a baby flying pterosaur out of the egg isn't being looked after by its parents. And also, like, you know, birds which are, you know, do rely heavily on parental care, even when they look like adults and are adults. They're, they're still, still feeding them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're still flying around with them and feeding them. Again, so yeah, so it, 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 it absolutely doesn't rule out parental care at all it would potentially be pretty different from what we see in birds of course because they're not making the same kind of nest they can't basically brood with the kind of shape that they are so they're probably doing something weird if they are doing it and again we'd expect parental care you know parental care is almost universal in birds and it is universal in crocodilians and it's there's very good evidence for it in dinosaurs there's no reason to think it wasn't present in birds were it not for the fact that Mali fowl don't operate parental care, they're the one group of isometric hyperprecocial animals. So, um, it, you know, it does all get a bit complicated. But as usual, you know, with so many of these things, when it comes to details of behaviour, you're looking at, you know, Mali fowl are really interesting and they clearly give us some cool pointers. But that's one group in a very different ecosystem doing something very different to all pterosaurs. And so I, well, in, I'm happy to use it as a model in some regards to give you some indication of what might be going on i wouldn't want to use it as well they don't do that therefore pterosaurs didn't do that because of makes yeah, sense it's one data point and the massive variation that we know we're not seeing exactly two people are like named after like bats or are associated with bats one is a superhero and the other is dracula and they're very mm. different things that's very true so. except for that except for that um batman dracula comic where yeah. he turns out the batman is a vampire but that's but, that's different, that's, that's different. Uh, it's different. It's different. <laughs> um so yeah that that is Ramphorhynchus you know at least 150 good specimens in public collections probably well over 200 all told that is a ton small ones adult ones soft tissue we know about growth we know about flight we know about diet um we know a hell of a lot about them i have one more question about them, and that is um the time how, how long are they around for when are they around do you know that off the top of your head? so they're so they're late jurassic i couldn't give you the exact date but the solenhofen is fairly well constrained um solenhofen's got loads and loads of ammonite which is good for ammonite dating Ooh. which is a pretty important thing um and therefore it's like exact beds have been dated to exact ammonite zones which can can be pretty narrow um yeah they they turn up in a few different ones they're definitely around for a while we have tended to lump them together um there's at least the possibility that you've got something like chrono species and there's subtly different species between the different layers but there's no particular reason to think that they were definitively different again the fact that they all sit on this dead straight line when you look at their growth trajectory whereas if they were you know if, if the one in i think it's malmzata is the is the german so malmzata one two three and four you think if the malmzata two group were actually a subtly different different species that they'd all cluster above or below that line and they don't so yeah they're they're pretty much all i think it's safe to consider them at least in a paleontological term a single species but yeah very very cool animals and actually one thing i failed to mention at this point a bit late in the day i know um but the the dark wing specimen is just what? worth bringing up so the Darkwing, it, I, I've argued in, in print, well, in my blog, that it's the single best individual pterosaur specimen in the world, and it's a Ramphorhynchus. Very, very annoyingly indeed, it's in private hands, though it has been loaned to a bunch of museums. Uh, it was on display for probably 10 years 
in a small museum in Eichstätt in southern Germany. It was sent to New York briefly for the pterosaur exhibition that they did a few years ago. So a lot of people have seen this thing, and it, uh, the the owner is and it's called the, the dark is very private. One. Like it's yeah, evil. And, and we'll we'll get on we'll get on to why in a second. Um, but there's lots of photos. Of, there are photos of it in the scientific literature, and there are measurements of it in the scientific literature. So even though it is a private specimen, bits of it have been made available. Um, there are casts of it in collections. So we it's it's one of those ones where it's not like totally hidden and completely inaccessible and etc um it's almost perfectly 3d and has been prepared in 3d and it is so as, as in that regard at least it's the best pterosaur i've ever seen it's a near perfect 3d skeleton the end of the tail's missing and the tips of both wings are missing but otherwise it's all there and like the ribs are articulated with the vertebrae wow. which you remember just how ridiculously fragile these animals are and how they all get crushed is incredible. Well, it obviously landed in like cotton candy and then oh, so, something. And... <laughs> but but like for that to have filled in those because ga- yeah. even just decay, you just flat collapse. Even if you're 3D, you just collapse. Um, so that's the incredible thing. And then the wings are preserved and they are almost black because of I can't remember what it is. The the exact they're evil. I think it's a I think it's a form of iron. I, as in, I can't remember what the mineralogy of it is. And I'm, you know, no, I'm no geologist at all. But they're they're almost black. Also, very annoyingly, they're on top of each other. So if you can imagine it rolled over with one arm to lie on top of the other. Like it's sleeping. So, the, so, yeah, so the two wings basically run parallel to each other. And so when you're looking at these wing membranes, you're kind of looking at one on top of the other. One of those panels peeled off, and that is in a museum. So there is half the wing membranes are in, a, in the Eichstatt collection. So those are available for study. Um, but this is the specimen that basically told us what pterosaur wing structure is. And the fact that you can see these stiffening fibers called actinofibrils these long like spaghetti like strands in the wing and a layer of blood vessels and this little kind of layer of called muscle fascia so just like like in our own skin but there's patches of like little muscle fibers running almost at random direction through it the dark wing is the specimen that told us this so again remphorhynchus being at like the hub of all pterosaur research this is the reason we know what pterosaur wings looked like um is a remphorhynchus amazing well, I don't think we've got time for a guest this week, so we won't. Because oh well, that's easy. There you go. We won't because it would just be like, "Hi, have you got a question?" We don't know. It was just a long time ago. There you go. That was guest number. Uh, so, yes, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed um, your Ramphorinkus journey that you took today with a man who's a bit obsessed. But we'll back away. It's fine. <laughs> He's pulling a face now. Um, sad, sad face. If you. Um, a big thank you to everybody who wants to support the show um, there are extra bonus episodes available on our Patreon please do check that out a big thank you to our patrons. without you we wouldn't be doing this because you are amazing and until next week thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast to support the show share this episode and leave us a review especially with dinosaur emojis on your app of choice you can also become a patron on patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards where you will be rewarded with extra content. For more information about Dave and Izzy and our books, other podcasts and blogs, please visit terriblelizards.co.uk. We hope to keep making this content and it's down to your support that we do, so thank you. <laughs>